about three weeks, four, five, six weeks ago, on the second day of class, I gave an unannounced quiz. Um, now, it wasn't really unannounced because I announced on the first day of class that there were unannounced quizzes. <laughs> but you don't do these unannounced quizzes to make friends. You do it to influence people. And it really, it really did. Um, out of the 247 in the class, 20 were um, not there. They're skipping already. <laughs> a, a quarter of them had read the material, which is about what I expected, and the other, you know, three quarters had not. Um, so I, what I did is I gave them a five, five question um, multiple choice, which basically if they knew the color of the cover of the book, they'd probably do okay on. And for, the, and for the other ones that hadn't read it, I gave them a one question essay. And the question on the essay went something like this. It says, when I am as old as Dr. H, the average lifestyle will be better than it is today. And they had to support or refute that statement. Now, the, it's really quite a bad question. You know, what's average? What's a lifestyle? Um, how old is he? Um, <laughs> and everybody did quite well except the one student that said, when I am 90 years old. Um, <laughs> but, but what came out of this was really remarkable. And I think about it every day, because what came out of it was two-thirds, 65%. Now, my N on this is 165, so I've got some numbers behind it. Two-thirds of these students said that the lifestyle will be worse when they're my age. And you know what they blamed it on? Technology. We're disconnected. Everybody's, everybody's texting everybody else. I, 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 I begged for the days when we have these awful phone conversations at the bus stop between students. Now they're just texting blankly to each other. They blame it on GMOs. They blame it on obesity. They blame it on our lifestyles. The fact that we're not getting out and doing anything. But the irony is, is the, right? the reason it's going to be better is because of technology. All right? Now that's the, that's the disconnect going on today. Now this is an interesting picture. We have right here, this is what we're going to talk about. This is hard on soils. And what it does is it makes these places look like this, where you have bedrock outcrop. I can take you in places in Lesotho where you can see the, 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 the scars from the plow on the bedrock. And you can't find the soil for a hundred for a football field away. All right? It's bad. But the other thing is, is that here, these are all great. AIDS is wiping them out. They have a decreasing population. These are the struggles the Africans deal with routinely. Um, and that's the thing. So where are we? I th I'm going to cover three things. Soils, population, and climate change. Um, and I'm going to go through it really fast, so hang on. This is, the, this is where the good soils are, where the green circles are. That's where the good soils are. The bad soils are basically, I, I'm going to focus on Africa. You'll see that soon. But the bad soils are there. We know about the Dust Bowl. We've seen that. But what we don't know is how bad it was. When I was in, when I was in college, I went home one time and talked to my, my parents, and I asked them some questions about the Dust Bowl. And the stories that came out were these. There was a, an ache in their voice. These were tough times. Mom talked about how, you know, it was so hot. In northwest Ohio, they would sleep outside at night, put a cool towel over them, let evaporative cooling kind of keep them, keep them cool. But she said in the morning, the dust on top, it was just black with dust on the top of those towels. That was the dust that went on. She talked about the fact that there was no food. It was tough. They were on the farm, so they had food. But they were two miles north of the railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central ran. Ran, it was an east-west route, New York, Chicago. It's, it's, it's two miles north, hobos would show up. They walked past a lot of places to get there for food. She talked about the fact that these people were very, very appreciative. And she said some of them had lost everything in the stock market crash. Some of them had suits on that were worn. It was a rough time. My, dad, my, my grandpa told me about how he almost lost a farm. He was $7 short for a farm payment. And down at the corner of Defiance Street and um, Stryker Street on the southwest corner, 
was a guy that the blacksmith that loaned him the money. Otherwise, they'd have been without a home. This is how bad it is. The problem with all this is, is that we know what to do. We still aren't doing it. We have issues in, in soils. We know we have to have crop residue cover on the surface. We know we got to quit doing the tillage. And we know we need to rotate crops. We don't do it. That's the way it is. We know this. We know that if, if we have 30% ground cover, we have an 80% reduction in erosion loss. We still don't do it. We still do too much tillage. We know that wind breaks will stop e wind erosion losses. If we had wind breaks every half mile, we wouldn't be talking about wind erosion. We still talk about it. We still see it. Here's one out of China. And it's not just China. This is the one here. And it talks about how bad it was. This is ongoing now. We still haven't learned. We know that if we do, if we keep the residue on the surface, we can grow a cover crop, we can roll that down, we can do direct planting, and we can grow a crop. We can fix nitrogen. We don't have to pay for it with, pe with, with petroleum. We know how to do this, but we don't. We choose not to because it's cheaper usually, but it's more expensive in the long run. In Africa, we, we have farmers that do this. They, they, put these, they dig these with a hoe. In, during the dry season, and then when the rains come, they go ahead and they, and they plant the seed immediately, and it works. We're trying to get farmers to do um, more intensive, sustainable intensification of their production system. To not, when people don't have enough food, they typically want to grow on more land. Extensive production. We're trying to intensify production on the land. We know we can get yields. We know that just a little bit of fertilizer will make a huge difference. We can get this much nitrogen out of legumes. This is some of our results. We've had results up to 15 tons, 200 bushels per acre, better than we have here. But every year we've had more than seven tons, more than 100 bushels. We can produce the food. It takes timely planting. It takes good seeds. It takes a bit of fertilizer. We need to take care of the pests. We can do this. Norman Borlaug, that's all he did. We can fix food production. We have to want to. This is some of the work we're doing now in Ethiopia. I got another grant here. That this is some stuff ongoing. We have 1,500 research plots across there. The data's coming out of this soon. But the data's going to be striking. This is what you see when you bring in better, better varieties and a little bit of fertilizer. We can change this. We can make a difference. But yet, we still see striking examples of erosion, all the sediment. It still goes on. We know better. We don't do better. And one of the reasons is that all these residues to protect the soil surface have uses. I've decided that the one thing I don't want to be is a donkey. Um, the work they do is just remarkable. We were driving down the road in Ethiopia, and we were going away from where the market was going to be, and it was fantastic. They had all these, all these donkeys were coming at us on the road, no people with them. They knew where to go. So it was just like the parting. All these donkeys, they come to the truck and they just part and go to the side. And they were going all, they're all going to the, to the market. They knew where they were going. Loaded down. Um, and they even put the residues in the tree. They put them in the tree so that the other animals don't get them. Somebody else is. These have value. There's value to these things. They value these things. We don't necessarily. And then we don't have just the animals and stuff going after our, our residues. We have the termites as well. We had a windstorm take down some plots in Mozambique, and we got there seven days later. You can see we're, doing, we're actually doing what I'm talking about here. We're, we're growing um, a cover crop in here. We're getting that started. It's coming. But the point is, these termites, if there's nothing to eat, they'll start eating everything. They're mean little boogers. And this is the one of the cobs that fell on the ground. They completely bored through the cobs. And this is in seven days. Now, we're doing some work there with, um, with using tephrosia, which is actually what the locals call it fish weed. You can, take a, you can take a branch of this, throw it in the, in, the, in, the, in the water, and a while later the fish will come up dead. It's the same thing it's in rotenone dust. We're putting this as a cover crop over the, the fields, and we're finding that the, 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 the um, termites just kind of say, well, this isn't a good place to be, and they'll move elsewhere. But this is the kind of work we have to do. Part two, population. This is us. All right, basically, around 1800, we had our first billion. Somewhere around the, the um, sinking of the Titanic, we got the second. Um, about my birth date, we had the third. 
and right now we're spitting out, we're popping out a billion every 12 years. Um, this is a lot of people. All right, Malthus tells that we don't have enough. You know, population is geometric, food production is linear. But the point is, when, when our students today get to 10 billion, there's going to be 2 billion unhappy people. We have about a billion right now, 850 million and change. They go to bed hungry every night. It's not an issue of having enough food. It's about distribution. They say that if, if all the food that we throw away here was distributed correctly, there wouldn't be hungry people. But that's not how it is. Where are the good soils? What we're finding is that where the population is growing, <laughs> they got bad soils. We have in North America and Russia, we have good soils. Where's the population growing? It's growing in places like Africa. Here we see the population growth. We're actually having negative growth in some of the northern climates. And this, this population growth is hitting us about our resources. This is Mozambique. Um, and the whole place has been clear cut. Clear cut. And the people are coming in and taking the trees that are left and they're making them into charcoal. So all you have is you either have smoke from making charcoal or you have smoke from burning charcoal. Um, and it takes about 10 kilograms of wood or 10 pounds of wood to get a pound of charcoal. Not very sustainable. And here you see there's, they'll slab cut them and they'll ship them back to the mother country. Now we're working with a group there. We're trying to do it in about three, two, three weeks. I'm heading to Mozambique to take out some plots on cassava. But we're looking to grow cassava tubers as a source for ethanol. And the point being is we're trying to get away from this lumber thing that is unsustainable. And you need to fly over the country. There's just nothing left. It's all going, old, old growths are going away. Trying to get the cassava to make the ethanol. Um, we're close. The price is a little bit higher. We're at, we're at about 73 cents. We need to be down to about 60 to compete with stuff coming in from across the border in South Africa. But that's, you know, if, if we'd get, if they'd, give, if they'd see the value in helping local people. But we have to support them. And then to make matters worse, you need to read a little about 21st century land grabs that are ongoing. For instance, in Mozambique right now, they have the Pro Savannah Plan where they're going to give large tracts of land away, long leases to other countries, Brazil, Japan, China. And it's, it's, it's so huge. In, in a 13-month period in 2008, a land was given away about 10% of the state of Tennessee, went away in 13 months. And they're saying that if this whole thing goes through, roughly half the people could be displaced, and a land area larger than the state of Tennessee will just be given away. And the point is there's, there are people living there now. These people are going to need this land. Climate change is a fact. We can argue a little bit about this last bump in, in CO2. You can argue if you want to, but the data is pretty stinking clear. Um, I turned on the news the other day and I'd I'd really like to have a nice little chat with John Kerry sometime where he talked about in, in Indonesia the fact that, um, you know, not everyone believes in climate change. Climate change is not a belief system. Climate change is a fact, all right? And that's just the way it is. Um, we have issues to deal with. This is stuff coming out of Mauna Loa. We, we, we went ahead of 400 ppm this last year. It's going up every year. You can see the, the, the annual, the diannual um, changes in, in CO2. We hear about the polar ice caps. We know they're getting smaller. Um, and then they get bigger, and so everybody says, oh, all the climate change people, the anti-climate change, you see, it's getting bigger. Well, that's the point. It's going to be ephemeral. It's going to come and go. The big point is, is that the old ice is going away. And that's a big deal. Here's a glacier I was at in 2001. Um, not the best picture, but you got to work with what you have. Um, <laughs> you know, but... Five years earlier, this glacier was five mi a half mile that direction. That's how much this one moved. I was on the Columbia Glacier. I was up to the Columbia Glacier this last summer, and from where I was in 2001, it's moved miles back. And that's a lot of ice. This thing sticks out of the, sticks out of the water about 400 feet. It's a big deal. We've seen these graphs. We've seen the hockey. They talk about the hockey stick graph here. You know, and how we're bumping up. Is it real? Well, I don't know. I think it's a pretty big deal. The interesting thing is here, if you look at how much emissions we have, gigatons of carbon per year, 
And then you, I put a little arrow in here because this is kind of interesting. This is some old data, 1938. This guy published this calendar. It's, it's a cool little paper. Um, and the point is he predicted with the slide rule that we would have a two, a two degree Celsius increase in temperature. He's spot on. He completely missed it with, with CO2. He predicted we would surpass 373 parts per million in 2200. We did that before the year 2000. This stuff is going up. And then there's another paper um, here by Ravel and Seuss. And then what they did is they did a, a cool thing looking at how long it takes for all this CO2 in the atmosphere to actually get into the ocean. And the point is, is we know that the pH of the ocean is going down. That's published. It's all over. Um, we know the impact of this. But the point is they're talking about using isotopes. It's a 10-year lag. So what we see now is really not what we have. We see what has already ha happened 10 years ago. So we just keep merrily going on without thinking back. Now, two minutes left. They're actually building a road here to the Beaufort Sea. They're going to put in a deep sea port. There's already papers published on where the routes are going to go. This is already done. There are people making money on this. The prospecting and stuff that's going on is already occurring. They're lining up on how to make money on it. This is going to happen. This is what's going on. The rest of us sit around and say, well, is it or isn't it? What can we do? We've got to make urban better. 70% will be urban by 2050. We've got to conserve the soil. They're going to need it. We can't give up 19% of our arable land like we have in some states in the last decade and a half. We can't carve up farms in, the, in this plant septic tanks in McMansions. We can't do it. Our generation did some bad stuff. We've got to get with it. We've got to get a vision. We've got to make a plan. We've got to focus on the goal. This is just typical the carbon cycle. We got to cut out the tillage down here. We can measure what goes on. This is some of the work we're doing. Um, we have 30 sensors on each. We'll measure what's going on, the, whole, the total energy balance of what's, what's happening. And this is what we find. You know, we see that with our wheat, we get sequestering and the tillage doesn't. We, all stuff we know, but it's real good data. In the past, we've had rivers on fire. We fixed it. We've had smog. The, the bottom pictures are in Chattanooga. Back in the 60s, women would have their, their pantyhose would actually dissolve because of the smog. We decided to fix it, so we did. These are some of the planters we have, terrible planters because they don't work. So they, we have work to do there. We're, try, we're working on several of these, a planting hoe. We have rolling planters, and then others that are draft, draft pulled. The point is we do a lot of good work, but we're doing on less than 1% of our budget. We don't put much money into it. And the whole thing is it's all about people. People is where the legacy is. We have to do all the training we can. I'm going to quit with this one. On This is the Van der Post panel in, in Sedito Hills, Botswana. Van der Post looked at what the Bushmen did. And in my class, I read about how bad things are and what goes on. And the fact is they made hard choices. It wasn't whether to do paper or plastic. They made life or death choices. That's what sustainable groups do. We need to do this. We need to make a plan. We need to get a vision. We need to implement it and move forward. Look to the horizon. And go.